discussing new and used books. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Instagram sensation Shelby Warman for the launch of her book, Awards for Big Boys. Uh, 
this is Fire Department GM to preserve brand optics. Thinks it's obviously not okay for men to physically slash emotionally abuse women. But it's friend Chad, who's been accused of those things. And really the guy who definitely didn't do those things. Uh, stand up to your friends or else you suck. Uh, this is an interesting thing that I think we should talk more about. It's a, it's a two slider. Okay, so the first one uh, is called the Good Boy Dog Pile. And it's a phenomenon wherein a wayward good boy gets called out in the comments, like my page, often rightfully, and is then called out again and again and again and again and again. So uh, as you can see on the bottom there, that's the good boy who uh, made a little call out. And then everyone on top of him is echoing what someone originally directed him. And uh, the little person on top is saying, hey, echo the thing. Everyone else is already abundantly articulated. just so meta. I, I run a page about uh, awarding people of all genders, but mostly men, um, you know, for being praised for doing the least. And then someone says something not 100% awesome in the comment section, and someone goes in and corrects them, and the first time it's like, awesome, here's a learning opportunity. And then 100 more people do the same thing. <laughs> Who are you proving this to? Why? Why are you telling me this? Like, and they just want people to clap for them, which if I could go back, please clap. Like, <laughs> and the inverse. Uh, good boys and girls propping up good boys. And this one starts at the top. It says, good boy gets called out in the comment section for a bad take. And then everyone else assembles our good boy. Uh, two is the swarm of commenters su who support this take and or are itching for a vague reason to hate on the specter of feminism chime in to give them a boost. Um, the amount of people who are willing to die on hills for strangers is never cease to amaze me. Um, especially people who've been following me for a second and know who I am and know my work and it's like a Jesus something they agree with and they're like, yeah, what do you say? And they're also defending cartoon men, which is incredible. <laughs> um, this one says, I don't have any more information to make me believe him over her, but I would trust him with my life. <laughs> and then this other this other gaslight came, maybe he is in there. Um, he's saying, everyone needs to calm down. This stranger is just trying to have a conversation. <laughs> and then at the very bottom, we've got, I like this take much better than the ladies. Lol. <laughs>
bitter apple, not as funny as Jude's law. <laughs> Penny bitch, you've made a vacuous man eating a cookie. <laughs> Unfunny cunt law. Hates <laughs> losers, vilifies them, sells merch, you must be a real prize. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Overreaction, your sex life must be so, so sad. <laughs> The amount of men who gotta know if my sex life is sad. Aren't they all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Come on, you gotta. Is this is this about a real person? No, no, no. It's just about me curvy being a sad, miserable wretch. <laughs> but it couldn't be real. Uh, here's the one. Uh, if you could just, how do I put this? Be my views and cheerleader and mother of flashlight guns. <laughs> less of a 
uh, a shaping and a molding of men, although obviously in any relationship with anyone of any gender, you're gonna mold and shape each other. But for me, the reverse rebellion was that I worked so, so, so hard to like chisel away at these people who were not ready to be present. And I gave so much energy to people because I saw potential in them, which is awesome. Like you want people to be better. And I, you know, there's a very fine line between putting mutual work into someone or something and then just working so hard on someone who isn't ready to receive that and will never receive that. So I learned, I learned a lot about that and I implicated myself big time. <laughs> the kinds of work that the man thing million and the woman thing million do are so different. Right? Really different. Yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like the 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 reverse Pygmalion is sculpting people to be emotionally available, whereas the, the man Pygmalion is just <laughs> forgoing uh, the personal together and just wanting a a statue and. Um, I think if anything, the woman is trying to bring someone more to life. So to me, that's like, oh, what a beautiful parallel. I'm like, how fucked up is that? <laughs> <laughs> it sucks. You write, you wrote in the Pygmalion chapter that that Ovid's Metamorphoses is a collection of stories about quote men, and you write uh, in quote in com in commas abusing, so ab or using abusing or using their pieces to validate and uphold their own work. But the Pygmalion story is different. It's the opposite. Um, he finds women in general lacking, so he decides to make his own women. Um, I, thought, uh, I can't. I'm not reading well because my contacts are spinning around. <laughs> um, I think like Pygmalion creates a woman who has no needs of her own, and, and it's all about his needs. And like when you when you pick Millie and a man, it's not about, I don't think it's about your needs. I think it's still about his needs. Yeah. Okay. If that's, I mean, for a brief uh, crash course, if anyone hasn't read my book, which is shameful, or doesn't know about pick Millie, which is less shameful. <laughs> pick Millie is this with this soldier named Pig Millie. Uh, he hates women, he builds his own, uh, he prays to Venus that she comes to life. She does, they fuck. Um, they have a child. Yeah. And it's, it's been retold a million times. Like, My Fair Lady is a Pygmalion story. Any, like, oh my god, she's been hot the whole time? <laughs> it's a Pygmalion story. Um, it's a woman Pygmalion is like, oh, I found this man, let me make him his, like, the self he really is, and he needs help being. And right, let me just it. demolish myself in the process. Yeah. Yeah, this one uh, this one says I really appreciate you taking the time to painstakingly chisel away at my rough exterior to turn me into the relatively emotionally available man I can sort of be. <laughs> also known as the vampire. She <laughs> says, Thank you for letting me drain you. So I could become a convincingly capable slash socially aware human and more readily attract people who will like the person you made me. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one says, tells you he likes you, but wants to clarify that he's happy in this liminal dating, but not dating thing. He says, isn't interested in kids, our personalized wedding vows, or a joint meeting accounts, so don't get the wrong idea, okay? <laughs> um, you, you love it when they have to do that. <laughs> when they can't just tell you that they like you, but they gotta also tell you that you're the one projecting these ideals onto their future and you're like, dude, I just want to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, speaking of, this is called the check-in and this girl says, hey, can we check in about what we're doing here? And then there's Gregorian chanting. <laughs> I'm not going to do it, but it, the, the chanting would say check-in, but it'd be Gregorian chanting. <laughs> and then she says, just like a brief chat about what to expect from each other, and then the chant <laughs> And he's gone. <laughs> why does he, do you ever ask anyone why they want to keep it liminal? Like, does that really serve anyone? Isn't it stressful? I think men really, let me, let me ask her stuff. I think a lot of good boys <laughs> get off. 
off and keeping things liminal because it's a power trip. Um, and I think it's also why when you ask to clarify what's going on, they'll pull the, I'm not trying to get married. You're like, I really just want to know how often we should hang out or if we should yeah. text at a certain time or if you're sleeping with other people. Yeah. Things that are so basic and so necessary. They make you feel like it's absurd that you could ever ask something like yeah. this. And you're like, no, like you're the one making it a big deal. And but that you're the one who's emotional, their logic is awesome. And that's that's when you start like every single thing they say or do becomes a sign. I think you wrote about that in the book and it, it like clarified this weird feeling like a stalker that happens when someone won't tell you something basic. You just like obsessively watch their Instagram and you start to hate yourself and you start to not want to ask things because you feel like a stalker. Yeah, a huge thing that I've learned the last few years is that uh, I do have those tendencies to, like, <laughs> to, to over invest in like, what other people are doing, but also I think a lot of that was because I was trying to private information out of people who weren't giving exactly. it. I don't think that's on you. It's not. <laughs> yeah. The one time I made art for a man, it was because he gave me so little and I just gave up on even ever texting him and it became art. So maybe that's what was happening with Petrarch. Like maybe Petrarch was the first left on red. He was like, I'm gonna make art about this. And everyone loved it. Like you put it out there and you're like, maybe she'll read it one day. Yeah, who even knows if Flora Petrarch's lover was real? I'm guessing she was a guy. Yeah. Is there writing about that? A lot of invent wonderful invented women are men, which makes them a little less horrible. <laughs> 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 okay, this one says, no, you're basically my girlfriend. I just think labels are part of the inner harmony of my brain. I'm obsessed with societal clusterfuck. <laughs> so you know this dude, the one who, like, <laughs> who uses, like, <laughs> the discourse. <laughs> this thing where uh, you feel like the asshole for me. Like, wait, no, I want to clarify. I don't want a label because I want that. So, like, how could you do something? I also thank you for a label, like, like apologizing for all the millions of years. Uh, this is actually the original yield left on right. Sorry. Uh, this yield woman says, my raven came back to me without my note. <laughs> I know Victor has seen my correspondence and yet not a raven in the chair. You know what's been happening forever. Uh, this one says, the internet is destroying us. It's ruining communication. Also him via text. Uh, the blue bubble says, when will you be free? And then he says, hmm, not sure. And then she says, can we have a quick phone call to figure this out faster? And red, challenging. <laughs> Um, a great litmus test that I've found for dating people and just friends in general. If they won't pick up the phone, don't bother. Um, phone calls are really, really good and really easy and really fast. Like, you don't need to text for five hours about what you're doing. You can call for 30 seconds and then not talk to each other. <laughs> so, so I learned while dating someone that, like, calling was the worst thing you could do. Um, and it should have been a red flag, but it wasn't. <laughs> but now I know, it's like, no, it's, yeah. Also, this just, this kind of, I think, uh, nicely gets at the hypocrisy of good boys, which is that. They'll say stuff like, the internet is ruining us. Like, why can't we connect anymore? And then you're like, hey, can we uh, figure out how to communicate us humans better? And then they'll leave you on red. <laughs> and then, um, these, this is blank. So this is the end of the slideshow, and it's also, I'll just leave this up here. It's a reminder that uh, this book and my work is super not done. I made it all up. Like, <laughs> what the fuck do I know? Um, and I want people to make their own and find the artists in it. And also, um, 
Yeah, just I, I started this project as what I call an emotional labor heuristic, which is just like a, a shorthand way of explaining things that are really messy and really painful and trying to have some fun with it. Um, and I think the coolest part of this whole project is been seeing that that uh, applies to people besides myself. It was fully about myself in the beginning. <laughs> and then people started caring, and I was like, oh shit. Uh, this, this is true for people besides me. So yeah, I'll just leave this up here. And you, if you make them in your free time, please send them my way. Do, do we need you to define good boy? I think it's been good time. Do you want to just say? Okay. I, can, I can give you a, a quick definition. Um, Uh, good boy, it's a noun. A man who would never do anything explicitly bad, quote unquote, by his or by his own measure, but consciously or not, uses his quote unquote goodness as a shield behind which he can get away with still pretty bad behavior on the grounds that it's not outwardly horrific. Mm -hmm. Are good boys usually like very woke people, or can you be can you be a Republican good boy? <laughs> That's an amazing question. Sure. Like I'm sure that I feel like a good boy definition is uh, contextual. So like within circles, you've got like the best, the best Republican good boy. <laughs> like, we love him. Like he's great. Um, but my experience has been like extremely liberal arts boys who are like we get it. way harder to talk to people who think that they get it about what they don't get yeah. than people who just like certainly know. And I also think that with so many men in my experience, like trying to unpack these like deeply, deeply ingrained ideas is just seen as them being lacking. Whereas like so many women and non-binary people I know are like, yeah, I don't know anything. Like we're all learning. Like yeah. it's a it's a journey. And men are like, I know. <laughs> I think that like the surest sign of a good boy is someone who like uh, I, I feel more theoretically is open to be wrong, which I drew for myself because I'm deeply right. But yeah, I think that that resistance to talking about things that they think that they really get is like the crucial uh, hallmark of a good boy. Someone's just, they, they know, they think they really know, and they're like, you're not so good because none of us are so good. And they're like, no, my mom says I'm amazing. Was <laughs> yeah. there a moment when you started drawing these? Can you pinpoint it? Uh, yeah, so I always think that it was like during my last job at lunch, but then I actually <laughs> I looked through um, some notebooks and I found the original Good Boys, and it was like, six years ago, I drew like this mini zine uh, that just drew boys that I had dated, but only by their profession. So it was like the photographer, <laughs> the videographer. Um, <laughs> 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 I don't have a lens or all of But yeah, it was like this whole zine about uh, things that they said to me when I set boundaries. And I didn't even remember doing that and then I was like going through my archives to kind of pull stuff for the book and I it was like oh no. What? It was like it wasn't exciting. It wasn't like oh I've been doing this cool. I was like oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> I did not realize that I had been thinking about things in this way for so long I totally blocked it out. Yeah did you feel like you just you can only do one thing and then forget about it and then do it again forever? <laughs> yeah that's what I was my whole life. <laughs> I think that's a lot of artists are like that. And that's why they have style. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you always write and draw together? Did one come first? I always wrote, um, and I was definitely like an artistic kid. Like I made stuff. I was like in crochet like, and weird stuff. But the cartooning came um, when I was at Oberlin. I inherited uh, the one and only satire paper. Wow. Yep. Um, <laughs> I 
fuck up the page counts and then like we would have five hours to print and I would draw uh, in spaces that I had left, that I had like misaligned things. Um, so that was how I started. <laughs> I do that to remember it has like since you've been putting these things on paper and like explaining them to yourself have have you been dealing with the boys differently yeah I think like the first year of writing the account I was really really angry I'm still really really angry um, but it was like anger in a way that oscillated between being productive and unproductive um, and it affected my relationships in real life with friends and people I was dating and I was just like, I had so much ire and I just knew that what I was drawing about was like, it was good and well worded but it is in no means radical, I don't consider it radical, I consider it just like a fact and like the extent to which people were getting angry at my work, especially like in the first year or so of doing it when I like didn't have a book, to, like had no, you know, Structural backing to be like, oh, she's legit. Um, I was just like, how are people so angry at this? And I knew, like, it wasn't, it wasn't surprising, but it was like really, really deeply upsetting. And I took that out like in every direction, everywhere. Yeah. Um, and now I feel like I've been learning to, to chill a little bit better and just to know uh, what's worth it and what's not. And I think that that has, um, in turn, given me like a renewed optimism. Not like in good ways necessarily. <laughs> Um, but just in like in being kinder and, and more patient to the ones that are actually in my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I relate to being angry and it's just feeling everywhere. Um. <laughs> Nothing is clear for me. Nothing to me is a 
clear example of both fragile masculinity and fragile good women than the terror they've expressed on face of my vibrator. <laughs> I feel like a human dildo, a dude I was at that very moment hooking up with said as I handed in my vibrator. articulated version, he expressed something that many cis dudes have told me before when they realized that, alas, their dick wasn't enough. <laughs> Which is not what it's about at all, but that seems to be the easiest conclusion for them to arrive at. This is a quote. You mean sticking my appendage in the hole, with no touching anywhere else. Your clip being treated like the lost city of Atlantis. Miss it and remember it all stories. But it's a merch too deep to find ever. Well, maybe a human dildo, ah yes, asking you to use this tool to help me come, because surprise, most people with vaginas need more than just penetration, suddenly relegated him to feeling like a tool. Fascinating. <laughs> it's very troll in the dungeon, one dude said about my Hitachi, referencing a specific scene in Harry Potter where they can be a troll with a club like weapon that does it not look like a vibrator. <laughs> very troll in the dungeon. <laughs> intimate with a machine involved. Uh, the robots are coming for our jobs. <laughs> I really think this was an automation take. I wanted to understand, but all I could think about was, if this man needed vibrators to come, maybe it would ex <laughs> that would explain, uh, they would be humming all the goddamn time. And maybe it would explain one of my favorite conspiracy theories, the hum. Uh, and then the asterisk is, the hum is a media reported on phenomenon due to Google, where some but not all people have reported hearing a low rumbling persistent hum. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I could have 
wait, are you gonna, oh no, maybe I shouldn't have, oh. I'm like, I'm like, I love it. You should be second guessing yourself all of the time. It's incredible. If, if my power in the world is like making men uncomfortable around me, like, fuck it. Like, come into my room, look at my art on my wall, it's like, okay, you're terrified. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I draw about people I know. Yep, mm -hmm, good, good, good. I would rather you say less and be honest about it. <laughs> Welcome to reality. Uh, most of us think pretty hard about what we say before we say it because there are consequences. Okay. Like, welcome to, oh, yeah, hello, welcome. <laughs> Does anyone go on a date with you just like sightsee kind of? Like, kind of like, I've had that. Really? So awful. Oh yeah. my god, I know that you've had that because yeah. I ran into someone out in front of a coffee shop and I was like, you I 
have too many other important things to be thinking about and worrying about and working on uh, than whether some dude is going to test you back. And if they're making you feel like that, they don't fucking deserve your time. like awards for good boys has made to like intersectionality and stuff like that and not just like men are trash but like all people can be trash um, <laughs> what um but how do you deal with like the exhaustion of like having a platform and deciding like what is the most important thing am i taking up space talking about just regular women should i be talking about other women who are disadvantaged even more than me and like is that exhausting for you and how do you decide or choose like how to use your voice that's super real and such a good question for anyone who couldn't hear it yeah. the, the question was basically um how do you decide what to give a shit about uh when you have such a public platform and like do you ever feel like you are taking up space talking about this, and you could be talking about that, and that's super real. Um, something that I have been thinking about recently, because I think like a year ago, I was like trying to do everything. I was like, I will post about everyone in need, I will fucking do it, I'm gonna change the world, and then I was like, oh no. <laughs> I think I'm trying to be a white savior here, and that's not good. Like, I think that disconnecting from the idea that like one person could do it all, or maybe just speak to everything, was like very humbling for me, where I was like, I have a huge platform, I take that very seriously, it's a big responsibility. I also cannot and should not be speaking for everyone or anyone. Um, so I try to amplify things. Um, I try not to be too hard on myself about like what is amplified versus what is not amplified, because ultimately, you don't need a platform to do cool shit, and you don't need a platform to organize, and you don't need a platform to make change. So anytime I kind of get like, I should be doing more, I'm like, you're not that important. Like, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like a, yes, we can always, it's, it's a fine line between apathy and then like, what's in your Like, I don't want to not give a shit, but also thinking that I'm a martyr who's going to save everyone is like super toxic in its own way. Um, so I try to just, post information mostly uh, about what I think that my followers need to see. Um, and at this point, it's just like, what's in my local community, like what things are kind of going on in the world. And there's always gonna be stuff that's left out. And I think that anyone who's expecting anyone to talk about everything all the time is willfully misinformed about how complicated the world is. But it's hard, like it's super hard. And, I get messages all the time, why aren't you posting about this? Why didn't you post about that? Why didn't you post about this? Why did you post about that? And it's like, oh my god, you post about it. <laughs> you can do it too. Like, I think that there's this idea that like only big verified platforms are allowed to, to give a shit. And it's like, it's cool to do that with your personal friends on your small account too. And like, your resistance to it is telling. Um, so, one of the things that I struggle with on a daily basis is, like, when a good boy does something good and I'm so relieved and thankful and I want to be like, thank you for not being shitty, yeah. and then I immediately catch myself and I'm like, no, you did the bare minimum, I'm not going to recognize you for just doing just the basically decent thing, like, yeah. saying good morning to me instead of, like, yeah. hitting on me. And, or you know, on the street randomly, yeah. or just anything like that. Do you yeah. like so? How do you balance that? Like, I'm not gonna validate you for doing what you should just do as a decent human being, yeah. versus like also I want to recognize that you weren't a piece of shit. Right. That's super real. Um, the question was, how do you tell good boys that they're doing a good job, but also like not perpetuate this idea that they're just doing a good job because they've not been them? Um, and I think that's kind of the crux of good boydom. Um, <laughs> like, I think this began because I was like so proud of my boyfriends for calling me back, and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> um, so I think uh, I think an important thing is just like, yeah, every you know, we're all alone sometimes. <laughs> I think that like that's a conversation that you can have with them. I think mean, you'd be like, thank you so much for doing that. I really appreciate it. I mean, here's the 
that when someone does do something that like you've asked them to and it's hurt you, like you absolutely sh should give them feedback for that. And positive feedback is awesome and we learn from it. Um, and some things aren't as easy for others as they are for us. So like say good morning might be really hard for him. And so like, it, no, you never know. Okay, but for this guy, oh, Brent, no, fuck that. <laughs> But I, I think something that I've learned in the past few years is just that like there's a lot of flexibility around like what people are good at. And so like yes, the bare minimum is like really, really bare, it's really down there. And yeah, like men eating above it is celebrated more than it should be. But also like different things, different people have different capacities. So for some people, like checking in about um, like other partners, if you're in a, a non-monogamous relationship, it's like super challenging. And if they do well, you should be like, hey, that went really well. Like, I appreciate that. Um, I think there's a way to give positive feedback without being like, you're my hero and I will marry you. <laughs> um, so like, uh, pallid positive feedback? Like, just like a neutral, just like, way, way to go. Um, I 
you can see it like in the way that even like women are represented in the media. Like something I learned from Dr. Tracer's book, like and this is gonna haunt you now. When you see um, when you see like news reported, you'll never see a woman politician with their mouth closed ever. They're always yelling, always with their mouth open, uh, which is part of why my people are always yelling. Um, also, I I can't draw anything else. So <laughs> them. Um, but I, I think that it's just important to find people who recognize that anger is productive. Obviously, like anger can be abusive. Like if you're yelling at people and like about them and it's like hurtful, that's not good. Um, but I think anger at situations and like at someone's behavior and at like how it fits into larger things, like that's real. And that's valid. And, if someone is trying to tell you, if someone goes to you because you're like, I'm angry about the way you treated me, you don't want that person at all, at all, at all, at all. Like run, 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 run. <laughs> you have to be able to communicate with someone about what they do that makes you angry. And like they should be able to do the same. One, one more here. Can I take a picture? 
Wait, no, actually, I realized that I just made a big thing about not having everyone's consent before I post pictures. This is just going to be for me. <laughs> or maybe I'll put it on my Instagram, but I'll give everyone a cartoon face. <laughs> It's what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna hold the button. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, it looks like an egg. <laughs> so where, what's the logistics of Hi, so I'm gonna be giving some instructions. Uh, the signing will be over 